Hello, this is Jai Bono. You're on the Jamin Show. My guest is Ashley Garrett. Um, hey, Ashley, welcome, welcome to the show today. Hi, thank you for having me. Absolutely, it's a pleasure. Um, okay, so can you tell me, tell me a, a little about yourself and how you got started in um, politics and how you got the internship at, ship, ship at, at the White House? Sure. Um, so I'm originally from Boston. I was born and raised here. Really? Me too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We're in Boston. I was actually born in born in Boston and moved moved, 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 moved out, out to Malden. And then, oh, okay. and then then I moved to Florida, but my mom passed, so I came out, I came out to Boston, you know. So yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So so yeah, yeah. So okay. So I'm sorry to talk to you. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, sure. So I was born and raised in Boston. And then from there, I went to college in Connecticut. I went to Wesleyan University and I did a program that is similar to political science. And so that's kind of how I started to um, get into like that particular type of world. And then also to like, um, my grandmother was a community activist and everything. And my dad served in the military and worked at the post office. Um, so that kind of like inspired me to like want to go into public service. And then um, for years, I just like came, I came back home and everything and I took care of my mom and I worked um, different types of jobs and everything. It had nothing to do with politics. Oh. <laughs> um, it's, it was very hard and everything to get in. And then finally I got into grad school in DC. Okay. And how I got into the White House is kind of by chance. Yeah. I just applied to a bunch of different jobs. I had been applying for jobs for the government since probably the year before I graduated college and I just had no luck wow. and, and I applied for the White House because I saw it online and I was like you know what what's the worst they can say is no and that's it <laughs> <laughs> and then um, from there I worked um, in the office of correspondence on foreign policy and defense so I basically read all the incoming email um, that was going to the president um, anything re um, having to do with foreign policy work um, the military, military issues, also veterans issues also fell underneath there and responding um, on the behalf of the president. And then also to, um, for matters of importance, like sending things up that would eventually reach the president and everything. So there's different, you know, ways that if you send an email, how it'll be treated and handled. Um, if there's a problem, then how can we help and assist with the problem? Um, if it's a policy suggestion, then like that will go to a different group and things of that sort. So I did that. Um, and I did that for about six months. And then from there, I was appointed to the Department of Defense and I worked on global um, health issues in the military. So basically, how does the military deal with situations like we have now? So what happens if the military is somewhere and they're in country? and there's a pandemic or an epidemic, how does the US military act and work with the host nation that they are in? Oh, wow, that's interesting, yeah. So what was it like to meet Michelle Obama and President Obama? Because those, those, those are some wonderful people, you know, I met Michelle Obama and yeah. she was nice. So what was it like, like, like to meet them, you know? Were they, were they nice to you? Yes, well, the president, is so the president of the United States doesn't have a lot of time. <laughs> so <laughs> we literally spent the whole entire day meeting the president of the United States. So you have to do all these like different security checks again, even though you already do security checks to even get into the building. Um, and then you're just kind of just like waiting. And so <laughs> you're just, you know, it's like a door opens and you're like, <gasps> and it's, it's just secret service doing another sweep. And you're like, oh, okay. All right. And another door opens and it's like, it's just, just somebody else going through, walking through and everything. So you're just kind of at edge mm -hmm. and you have 15 minutes of his time. And so he's like trying, they're trying to like schedule him to meet you guys. And like also to like, you know, he's the leader of the free world. So it's like, he has all these other things. So we didn't actually spend a lot of time with him. Mm -hmm. um, he came in and was like, I just remember like being like, oh my God, there's the president. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. And I'm just like, who am I? How do I even get here? Mm -hmm. um, because at least for me, like, you know, it is like a great honor and it's very shocking and stuff and everything because like, I don't come from that world. You know, I didn't, you know, grow up with that and everything. For some other people, they're like, oh yeah, like I've met my fifth president. Like I've met, you know, this person, that person and everything. Like, you know, they're very nonchalant about it. Um, but yeah, we met him briefly. Um, he did the photo op with us. We were allowed to have three questions. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it was nice. It was nice. Um, I think me and Michelle was there just because.
because we had more time with her. So mm -hmm. we got, we had her actually come and speak to us as well. Okay. And we had probably maybe like two, maybe three hours with her. Oh, wow. Um, so it was really nice to like actually hear her speak, her to be very candid with us, um, which is really great. Because I think the biggest thing is that if you want to increase diversity in these types of places and these types of businesses and these types of organizations and anything, you need to give people a bath, show people how to do it, show people how you go from A to B to C and everything. And just having her speak to us and talk about her life and her struggles and the difficulties and how, you know, just relatable she was. Like, she's very, very relatable. Um, and I was like, wow, like, I could also do that. I can also do these things. I also have these um, opportunities and things of that sort. Like, you know, I, I can I can also do that. So I think that was really great. And then um, just actually just, you know, getting to talk to her briefly and like, you know, we all got hugs and stuff from her, which was really yeah. nice. It was just like, I can't believe we're being hugged by the first lady yeah. in the United States. <laughs> Um, and then and then the photo op and everything, which is also very nice that she takes the time to do a photo op with every department, mm -hmm. the entire intern class and everything, which is like you you get more personalized experience. Um, so yeah, both were just incredible opportunities. I'm very happy that I was able to have them. I'm very happy I took the chance and threw my name into the cap. So yeah, that's a real honor because I love I love to meet the White House and go to the White House and meet the president. You know, I wish I could have you know because I got to meet I got to meet Michelle Obama for, at a volunteer event in Boston, so that was nice. But nice. Yeah. and then you know, and then I met President Obama in New Hampshire, but I didn't get a picture. I'm so trying, I'm so trying to get a picture. You know, yeah. you know. what a volunteer event were you at? I was. She came. To, she came to the to the um to the um. I, I think it was the um Boston World Boston World Trade Center, and I volunteered there. And after she spoke, I went down. I took a picture and talked for me, so that was nice. Man. And I met a person Obama in Manchester, New Hampshire. I shook his hand, but I couldn't get a picture because some people there, you know. So, but hopefully, I will, you know, because I still want to meet him, you know, because he's the best, he's the best person we had, you know. So, yeah. And it's like, it's like sometimes you, 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 you get upset because they charge ten dollars for a picture of the president, and it's kind of crazy if you can't afford that, you know. I and I kind of get to think a photo, a photo should be free, you know, but for the president, they charge ten thousand dollars, you know. And, and a lot of people, people can't afford that, you know, and it's like. Uh, so I did not, I never heard of that. So it might be just the people who put on the event. Yeah. Are controlling that and everything. And so that's why they're doing it. Yeah. Um, most of the time, if you meet, if you are an event and you meet the president, at least from my experience at working at the White House, mm -hmm. it's free. <laughs> like you just, <laughs> they, you know, they have a short, obviously they have a short window of mm -hmm. that. Um, like I went to an event and I met Ayanna Presley. Oh, yeah, in a very brief window, so it's like you really have to get in there if you can. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I've met Ayanna Presley a bunch of times. She's I found her for she's she's nice, you know. And I'm trying to get on, on my show as well. You know, I try to even try to get Michelle Obama on my show, but that's kind of hard, you know. But, but I tried, you know. So you know, and I know they're busy, but still, best have have the president on your show, you know. So you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, but like I said, and. I saw you got to go. I saw you saw that you, that you got to go go on Air Force One, in in the presidential limo. limo. And what was that like? Oh, so that is um. So there's basically a replica, and mm -hmm. it's a replica of the plane, and also too they have like one of the limos. So it's basically oh. kind of like it's a traveling replica. So it actually flies, oh. um, but they have it around the country, and it basically profiles um the plane and everything because. The Air Force One um, demarcation basically is the plane, whatever plane the president is on mm -hmm. is the demarcation for Air Force One. So there's actually a bunch of like different um, US government planes and everything that ambassadors and their personnel and everything will fly on, but that's not technically considered Air Force One because the president is not on there. Um, so that was a nice experience. Um, while though, while I was at the White House, we did get to see Marine One. So they have um, the choppers and stuff and everything. And while I was there, we got to see Obama head out to South by Southwest. Oh, wow. And so that's a great experience where um, staff, but then also to like, they'll have like constituents that will come in like military personnel or like other people who have written and everything. They'll invite them to come down to DC. And basically, um, there's like a little like stretch on the patio where you can wait, and then the president will come out and like 
he'll usually wave or, you know, shake hands like that if he has time um, and some of the staff and they get on Marine One and Marine One will fly them usually to Air Force One because the um, the planes are actually a little bit outside of DC. Yeah. Um, they're on a base and everything. So usually the president will take the chopper and everything. Um, sometimes they'll just take the chopper because it's just easier to, to yeah. do that instead of fighting through traffic and everything. Although when you are a part of the presidential motorcade or the vice presidential motorcade, you usually get priority. Many of the times me and Joe Biden were trying to leave the White House at the same time and what? his mode cave cut off my bus. <laughs> so I had to wait for him to get home before I could go to class. Um, so yeah, that was a great opportunity and just, you know, see the president and stuff and, you know, he waved to us and the staff members and everything. And, you know, he, all, I would say, I haven't met uh, any other presidents, mm -hmm. um, but I would say in comparison to things and stories I've heard from other people, he was just a very personal person. And so he always tried to take the time to, you know, talk to people, make people feel at home, make people feel welcome and stuff like other staff members, whether you were, you know, part of maintenance or if you were, you know, an advisor or whatever have you, like try to make everyone feel like, you know, you're a part of it. Um, while I was there, I met one of the, um, so, cause the White House has a lot of demarcation. So, mm -hmm military base it's a residence it's an office um it's a national park mm -hmm. uh, it's a museum um and so the national park service helps maintain the white house so they do all the lawn keeping and everything and they had um a national parks personnel um big ed and big ed had been there since nixon he had worked for every president since then and he was going to retire and president obama wrote him a note a person to know and asked him if he could wait and Big Ed was like, you know what, for you, sir, I will. And he had, yeah, he had been at the White House, like, for decades. And just, like, he was one of those people where it's, like, meeting the president is nothing, like, you know, because he had met so many and worked for so many yeah. and had so many um, pictures and, you know, other, like, things. So he had seen it all and everything. But, yeah, he, Big Ed was, you know, very friendly, very nice and everything. And the president was always very nice to him. Um, and, you know, he was saying he was like, he's probably one of the best presidents I ever worked for because yeah. he treats you like a person regardless of where you are. Mm -hmm. Yes, he does, you know, because I, I remember when I, when I met him in Boston, he actually gave me a quick hug, and I was like, wow, President Obama actually hugged me, you know, and that was a, yeah. so that was a lesson to, you know, and you said you also met, you also, you said you also met Joe Biden? Yes. Yeah. Um, so Joe Biden also, there's actually, um, <laughs> There used to be actually a competition between him and Valerie Jarrett of who would speak the longest to the interns. So they always told us like, um, when both of them are gonna speak to us, make sure you are ready. Like make sure you've eaten, make sure you have used the bathroom. You don't have anything else waiting cause it's gonna be, it might be the entire day. So don't, so just clear your schedule and just let it, just let it happen. Um, so yes, Joe Biden also spoke to us and sp actually spent a lot of time and he also was very personal because he actually got out into the audience, which Secret Service obviously hates, like, because he's like going into the audience and he's like shaking people's hands and all this kind of stuff. Like he went and, he, you know, he shook my hand when I asked my question and all that kind of stuff. And like, you could see Secret Service in the background is like, don't kick off. Because yeah. you never know with people and everything, even though, you know, they do tons of security checks and everything and all this kind of stuff and everything. Um, but he's just like one of those people, like he's not going to just sit there, like he's going to actually interact with you and talk to you because mm -hmm. um, he's very much a people person. Um, so I did get a chance to meet him as well, um, in addition to other senior staff members as part of the administration and everything. They all made sure it took time to speak to us um and you know really you know talk to the interns and everything answer our questions um yeah it was it was a very enlightening experience i'm really happy that i took the opportunity and i wish more people would mm -hmm. um, take those opportunities and apply and also apply for the transition you know apply for the administration like there are so many jobs you know you, you don't have to be secretary of state yeah. you, know? you can be if you want that you know that's a possibility but um, there's so many other jobs within the administration 
that people can apply for, but a lot of times people get hesitant or they get nervous. Um, the competition is very steep. I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, you are competing with a lot of people, but that doesn't mean that you don't have value to add. You don't have things. It's not like you don't have things to add. I think a lot of people do, um, especially people who are not from that particular world. You know, I think they even have more to add and more insight in sharing those things and sharing their experiences. And I hope that more people get involved, whether it's, you know, volunteering, um, working, working on campaigns, working, you know, at events. I think that's another thing, another great opportunity that people can take. Yeah. Um, and just going to things like, you know, going to Christmas at the White House, going to the Easter Grove, like these are things that normal people can do and participate part of. Like, it really is, you know, the people's house. It really is, you yeah. know this is you know as as an american like this is you you know you and like you are a part of this and, and things of that sort yeah that's a blessing because i because i remember obama saying that this is the people's house and that's they have a person said as, as a blessing you know so i think that's great you know and you got to experience that you know um so was secret service nice to you but are, are they nice to, nice to you i mean what's like being with the secret service where they, they they're, they're not mean are they um, I personally, the, the agents that I met, they were all very nice, all very well trained, <laughs> very well trained. Um, but overall, they were always nice, like, um, even the people who staff the White House, like the museum part. Um, what's great about them is a lot of times they know the historical things. So um, when I would give tours and everything, if I didn't know anything, or if I had questions, I would ask them and be like, hey, like, which portrait is this, this, and that, or what, like, what year was this, and everything, and, like, they would, like, no, like, I don't know for that particular detail if you have to have, like, a historical degree or something, but um, they were just, like, right on it, like, they knew, um, they were so friendly, and nice, like, when my family came to visit, um, one of my uncles and everything, he has some health um, issues and everything, and they were just the nicest to him and everything, and, you know, we were very helpful, um, and, you know, making sure, you know, he had places to sit when he needed to take a rest and things of that sort. So they're very, it's, it's a very tedious job, um, especially depending on your detail and depending on like what you're doing, because there's different facets, you know, Secret Service is their own entity. And so there are different things that they do other than providing protection services. Um, and it can be very hard, especially, you know, when you're, you have to post somewhere, you're there all night and things of that sort. Um, but very professional, very nice, very kind. Um, that's why it was so upsetting to hear that so many of them have been exposed to COVID recently. Um, and, you know, because, you know, it's already a tough job. Mm -hmm. And then having to, you know, be put on the line for these things and everything is very difficult. Yeah, I can, I can definitely imagine. Um, did you also, did, did you also get to meet Sasha and Leah? No. Um, so they were very big about making sure their kids were kids. And okay. so making sure that, you know, try to the best ability, you know, because they are private citizens. And I think that's something that people forget that they're private citizens, like their dad is the president of the United States, but they are not, they just happen to be born into that family. Um, so I never really got to meet them or see them. Um, I did get to meet Bo and Sunny because they frequently will go out for walks. Yeah. It's it's kind of funny because they're some of the most famous dogs and they're just dogs. Like they have no idea. <laughs> like people are like, oh my God, it's Bo and Sunny. And they're just like looking for snacks or like whatever, just doing things that dogs do and, and like have no idea. Um, but yeah, they were really friendly. And the person who was like their handler and stuff and everything, um, they were like, you know, if they had time, they would always like let you get a picture with the dogs and, and things of that sort. And you would, yeah, you would just see them being walked like through the compound and everything, just normally as normal dogs and everything. Sometimes the, sometimes Big Ed from the park service would walk them too. So you would, you know, look out the window, and you would see him walking Bo and Sunny and, you know, playing with them. Um, so yeah, that was nice. <laughs> oh, yeah, I can imagine. That's definitely a good experience, you know. Yeah. So would you consider running for president yourself or in the future? I would say never say never. I would say right now, no. <laughs> um, but who knows? You have no idea what the future may hold. Um, I mean, I never thought I would ever uh, work for the White House. So, um, and a number of things that I did, I never thought I would ever do. So you just never know. Um, 
yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I, I always have had a commitment to serve and try to make America a better place. It is a very, very stressful job, though. I will say that. And in some ways, I feel like it's gotten more stressful because of the climate that we live in in the last couple of years, where it's like everything is under scrutiny. So um, if you if you like a particular type of condiment, you know, it's like that's under scrutiny. Um, if you wear the wrong type of suit, you know, that's under scrutiny and things of that sort. Whereas, you know, past presidents didn't even have to deal with that. Even things that, that should have been under scrutiny was not under scrutiny with past presidents. Um, and it could just be a very stressful job. So, but who knows what the future has and what the future may hold. I guess that's true, yeah. Cause I thought about, I thought about running for president too, and maybe at some point, you know, help, so I can help people, you know, cause I know it can be a special job, but I always want, want to help people on my podcast show. And I think that if you're president, you can definitely help people. So I want to try and give back too, as much as I can. Yeah, I think, I think that's the biggest thing that we can do is that, you know, it doesn't have to be a grandiose thing. Like, you know, have to be like, ah, oh, don't donate a million dollars. I mean, if you can, great. But um, I think if everyone can try to do their part a little bit by little bit and try to, you know, do whatever they can, whether it's sharing information, um, talking to people, getting people involved, getting people active, and especially on the local level, like um, I've been home the last few months and everything and just try to get more involved with things here in Boston. And, you know, using some of my experience and my knowledge and stuff from living in D.C. and working in the federal government to help things here. Because um, I feel like a lot of people just, they just don't know and they don't have any idea and not realizing, like, you know, this is your government, too. Like, you know, you have a say. You can, you know, speak up about the things that's going on here in the community as well. I, 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 are you in Boston right now? Yes. Oh, I'm in Boston, too. Yeah, it's, I didn't know that. Wow. Boxbury, that's good, cool. Mm -hmm. Maybe you'll see my boss sometime, you know. Yeah. Yeah, at the grocery store. <laughs> yeah. You recognize me with my mask and stuff. <laughs> um, so, do you find I'm looking, do you find I'm looking, looking, for, looking for Joe Biden as president now, if he, if he calls you? If I got the opportunity to serve, I definitely most likely will accept. Mm -hmm. um, just because I feel like right now the need is very critical. Um, there's just a lot of work that has to be done from um, rebuilding the country via health-wise mm -hmm. um, and getting things in place, getting um, just, you know, coordinating things, making sure um, we have, you know, the things that we need. I mean, right now we're having another shortage of PPE again, and there are outbreaks. So there's just like on that front, there's so much work that needs to be done there. Um, the economy, rebuilding econ the economy and everything, um, that's something that has to be done and it's a little bit more intense than happening COVID because some businesses sadly were going through and failing and having issues before COVID even started. And then afterwards and everything that ended up being, you know, the final blow. And so reorganizing an economy that is fair and equitable to more people versus then what we have been seeing where now you have kind of almost a separation where, you know, the market and the economy are working um, in different directions. And you've had some people who have, you know, really, you know, have benefit from COVID and, you know, are doing great financially. And you have other people who are nearly bankrupt, if not worse. And so reorganizing and structuring that. And then also to the third prong of that is building, rebuilding relations abroad, you know, the foreign service and also to our live, our relationships abroad have been hurt deeply and, you know, there's a lot of distrust and everything with the United States right now and whether or not, and it's, it has weakened us. And I think that's something that people have not realized because there's been so many issues domestically. You can't even start to think about what's happening outside the United States because there's just been so much issues here domestically. So uh, if needed, I would serve. Um, but it's, like I said, it's very competitive. So you don't know. Um, they're still staffing. It's going to take a while because just um, the different types of staff placements that they have to do and everything, getting the White House, um, seeing what happens after with the last administration. So whether or not they're going to be more cooperative and friendly. I know when I was working the transition for um, the Trump administration, like we constantly got the message, like be as helpful as possible, be cooperative possible. Like every couple of days we would get emails, you know, from our secretary being like, 
be helpful. Don't do this. Don't do that. Like be helpful as possible. Um, so it was kind of surprising to see now, you know, the shoe on the other foot, that's not happening. And there's been so much difficulty and so much of a push and everything for that. Um, so I, you know, I hope that things, the transition does get better and get smoother. Um, and I hope that they do a good job. I know for us, we had to basically write you know, what our jobs were, the different things we were doing, the different policies we were working on. So that way the person that would come behind us could easily just pick up and then continue what we were doing. Because a lot of things are not political. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. And it's like, you know, and a lot of things shouldn't be political. I mean, everything that's happening now with COVID, that should not be political. Like this pandemics and epidemics should not be political whatsoever. Um, and so I hope that as, you know, we move closer to January, things will get better. Um, there'll be much more smoother and everything. I can see that the Biden team is a little bit more careful than yeah. other people in the past in terms of picking people. Um, and so there seems to be a lot of thought that has been given to giving people certain appointments and trying to build the teams out, you know, for the different departments, for the different entities. Um, and really bringing in a mixture of some people from the Obama administration, but then also some new faces as well. Um, so I, I have high hopes, um, but I know it's going to take a while to get things done. And, and we don't know what's going to happen. Like, is it going to be a peaceful transition? Hopefully it is. Mm -hmm. um, but we just have to wait and see. I guess that's true. And so you're saying you should work for, for Trump for Trump for a while as president too? Say that again? So you work for Trump as pres for Trump as president for a while too. After Obama, you work for the Trump administration as well. No, so as an appointee, um, so unless you're reappointed, oh. um, you do not work for the next administration. Oh, I see. Um, typically, in the past, people have been reappointed by administrations, even if they are different parties, because the work that they do is not political. So, for instance, people who work in um, anything involving um, some of the national defense things, they will just get reappointed because the work that they do doesn't, it, it doesn't matter in terms of political party because um, they're maybe in an oversight capacity or things of that sort. So those things just have to keep moving. Um, and you saw that, you know, with the Obama administration, the Bush administration, you know, like, you know, Bush kept some Clinton people, Obama kept some Bush people. Um, so in certain capacities, you know, people like continuity. So they'll just like have people stay um, where the Trump administration didn't appoint any, reappoint anybody. And that ended up causing a lot of issues and friction because they didn't reappoint anybody and then they didn't appoint any of their own people to come in and take positions. So even now the government has been running very understaffed and you have a lot of people who, you have a lot of positions that never got confirmed through Congress because they've just been acting. So you have a lot of heads of agencies that they have been in the acting role and acting capacity and not having an actual appointee there doing that um, work. And they've been understaffed and it's caused a lot of stress for people in the government uh, because they don't have as much staffing capacity and capability that they had previously. Um, so I worked right up until the 20th and then we had to turn in everything. We had to, you know, give our resignation letters and everything. But I basically helped like during that period um, in December and January to trans Tracy um, transfer things in our office that were done by appointees over to the next administration. I see. Uh -huh. Now, do you still keep in touch with President Obama since he's not president anymore? Have you, you still, uh, uh, do you still keep in touch with him basically or uh, email or? Uh... Um, it's very hard. <laughs> so I think a lot of people have to understand that the White House staff is about 400, 500 people. Um, and so even though you may work there, you, there's a good chance you don't see the president and you don't actually have, um, you don't actually really get to communicate with them. You know, you don't have their personal number or anything of that sort. Um, so I have not, the only thing um, we were able to do one time is that he uh, did a thing for Obama alumni where he kind of like spoke to us about what was going on in the country and the administration. Um, so we, there was like a Zoom call that we were able to participate in, which was very nice. Oh. Um, but for the most part, no, you don't get to really 
keep in touch like I've, I keep in touch with my colleagues so like the people I worked with directly daily on the daily basis um but like the principals and stuff and everything it's like they have their staff and that's it and then you know once they leave then they you have you know whatever staff or or things like that like the Obamas they have a, their own foundation and so that's a lot of their work um and through the foundation and some people who worked um in the administration also worked um for the foundation um so i did not i do not have a personal communication with the president so it would be nice but or it'd be nice to have personal communication with the first lady but sadly i do not i know if you ask me too that's just talk to my one-on-one you know you know I, you know yeah but maybe if you go to work for joe biden you know i love the i don't, I don't think wolf you know because you know hopefully him you know that might be a good opportunity to get to get that job, you know. Mm. Yeah, that'd be, you know, yeah. Yeah, I hope, I hope to find you get it, you know, because you deserve it, you know. So, and I did make some money, more changes with Joe Biden as president, you know. Like, man, him, he's a good guy, so I support Joe. I fought for him, you know, so I'm glad he's in, you know. Him and, mm-hmm. him and Camille, you know, I think they're going to make some good changes. You know? mm-hmm. Yeah, so, yeah, so where do you see yourself uh, 10 years from now, or down the line, doing? I have no idea. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure. Um, hopefully I would like to, um, go into foreign policy, um, and work for the state department. Um, but that's also another very competitive, very competition, very competition laced organization. Um, and those jobs are very hard to come by. Um, but just given the work that I've been doing in oversight the last few years and everything, I feel like that's a particular arena, especially when it comes to um, donating money and running programs, is something that could use a lot of oversight and kind of more evaluation to make sure that when we say, okay, we're going to do this to help a country, that it actually helps our host nations and the people that we're working with. And that the money that we are donating or the money that we are using is going to actually help people versus um, having issues where it's like programs are being done or things are being done, but it's not actually solving the problems that need to be solved. Okay, yeah. Okay, I, I, I just, have, I just have, have a few more questions, okay? A few more questions. Um, so, how is the, so how is the pandemic affecting your business? How, is, how is, has the pandemic been affecting you particularly? Um, it's just very hard, just like a lot of people. So I miss, you know, I miss seeing my friends. I miss seeing my, you know, my family members and everything. You know, recently it was Thanksgiving and we had a very small Thanksgiving. Um, so seeing family members, um, it's been hard in terms of just, you know, going to work. So having to work around things like not being able to have meetings or go to conferences and things of that sort. Um, having delays and trying to get information out because, the first priority is always COVID. So it's like, you know, whatever resources that are are there and stuff and everything, it's like, we have to focus on what's happening with COVID, have to make sure those things. So it's just been very difficult. It's also very difficult to see so many people um, getting sick mm-hmm. um, or losing family members. Like I had a friend from college and, you know, her grandmother passed away. Oh, so. um, her mom was sick luckily her mom recovered her uncle recovered um her other Mm -hmm. uncle recovered but you know just seeing those types of things and it's so hard because it kind of happened very suddenly you know where it was like okay you know you see it happening in other parts and then you start to see cases and then all of a sudden you know we're in a lockdown and you know we're going almost a year like we're closer to next march than we are you know the previous march Mm-hmm. And it's just been very difficult in terms of those things and not being able to just enjoy life yeah. and having it, um, you know, seeing it get, getting worse and everything. I think it's a little bit scary. I thought we, you know, we were trending better and now it just seems like it's going to get worse and it seems like it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay. Um, and, you know, still ha- having the issues in how political size it is and how, I think also to just lack of compassion that people have because they want to put these political values over anything else, you know, over people's lives, over people's well-being. Um, and I, I, I just don't understand. I, at this point, like, I just, I just don't get it. 
um, you know, just wear a mask. Mm-hmm. Like if more people just wear masks, we can lower the rates. We can stop the transmission and stuff and everything. We can lower rates. Like we see that in other countries and everything. Um, other countries have been able to return to somewhat back to normal. Um, and just, you know, people are still having difficulties with that. And it just, it's make, it makes things worse, you know, because it's like, you know, things continue to still have to be canceled. We still have to keep altering things and everything until this is done. And I'm, I'm hoping in the next, you know, year or so, you know, the, the, the worst outlines that they have predicted don't become true. And I'm hoping that, you know, in the next six months or so, things are improved. Yeah, me too. Um, so how was, so how do you feel about, you know, um, about, about the salvation, about the salvation, you know, George Floyd, how did that affect you, please, I mean, the protesting George Floyd, because that was so sad. How did that affect you physically, you know, see men Can you repeat being, that again? I was asking how you, how you, how you feel about George Floyd and the, and the protesting and the racism, how is it affecting you? I mean, where the world is, it's, it's kind of scary, you know, seeing that kind of stuff, you know, how, how did that affect you? I think it was very upsetting because it was just like, once again, this is something that's keep happening. And for me, it was just hard because it's very clear that that shouldn't have happened. Like I, I don't, I don't understand how it was able to happen. I don't understand how people weren't upset or they, they, you know, made, um, you know, excuses for it and things of that, like, those things are just clearly just not needed and not necessary. And I, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand how these things continue to keep happening and everything and these types of force are continue to be allowed and how people don't understand that people are people like you, you, we have a criminal justice system for a reason and that's not being utilized and things are being happened where they're going out of the way and out of the picture and stuff and everything for these things and it's like they're not following procedure they're not following things like you know being accused of something isn't doesn't mean that you did it mm-hmm. and even if you do did it doesn't mean you deserve to die like we have a whole entire criminal justice system and a process and everything that can if if your state has the death penalty that can issue the death penalty in such a way, it shouldn't just be done by people on the street or whatever have you and things of that sort. And I think what's scary is that these things are still happening. These years, you're still hearing these cases, you're still, and, and these are just the ones we hear, you know, there's so many ones that we probably don't hear about or don't get picked up um, on the news and things of that sort. And so it just, it reminds me of how much that stuff has to change and it has to be more than just protests. Um, it has to be a whole overall, the legal system. One of the things that people have been working on is like getting better prosecutors and everything and attorney generals and everything because those elections matter and a lot of people don't realize those elections matter and realize running for those offices and everything matters as well because um, it's like I had a professor in, in grad school where it's like, you know, fish stinks from the head down. So if at the top there's, there's issues, then you're going to see them everywhere. And so you have to start to reform everything. You can't just be like, okay, we're just going to move resources from the police and put them into these other entities. Well, you're still going to have a system and a process that doesn't deliver justice, that doesn't deliver, you know, peace of mind to people and everything if you still have these judges, if you still have these prosecutors, if you still have these attorney generals who don't believe in it, don't believe in, in fair justice practices. It's why, you know, we still have people who are in prison for marijuana, even though in a lot of states, marijuana is, is legal now, but you still have people who are in prison for something that now is legal and they can't even work in those industries because they have a criminal record and they're nonviolent, they're nonviolent offenders. I know that's sad, you know, because I hear every day all the time, you know, it's like they should be able to get part of free, you know, because it's because they did the time, so they should be able to have a second chance of life, you know. So I definitely agree, you know. Yeah. So what do you think? What do you think we can do to change the world? You know, to make the world better, in your opinion. Coffee. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot of things that has to be done, but I think more people just have to get involved 
in a way and stay consistent. And so taking a cause, whether that's the environment, whether it's criminal justice, whether it's poverty, um, whatever have you, because all of this stuff is interconnected and related. And we as a world, I think the pandemic has showed us is that we are as a world are interconnected and in, in, in everything and related. Um, and you can't close the door on globalism. Like at this point, we live in global communities. We do things globally. You can't close the door. Like people are just like, well, this is why we should just do everything here in the United States and not be bothered with other people or not have that. And I'm like, that's a simple solution to a complex problem that is unrealistic. You know, many of us work for companies and jobs and everything that are owned by entities overseas. We buy products from overseas. We consume media from overseas. Um, if you look in the last like 10 years, you see like so much has changed and you see so much, you know, culture and stuff and everything that you would only see in certain parts of the world. Now you see it everywhere because, you know, the younger generations have been able to access things online and media and share things. And so you're seeing, you know, development and stuff of things like, you know, like net, like for instance, like the trend of axe throwing, like a lot of cities have axe throwing places and you're seeing it in other parts of the world like they have those places in brazil they have those places in china and india um because of global trends and like you know one person sees it somewhere else and they're like hey we could do that here um and just like a growth in certain industries and so i feel like if people start to really one ask the questions and not be afraid i think sometimes when we start to ask questions and say things, people get afraid and be like, oh, well, that's not a thing or this isn't that. Um, and really start to work on those things and start to work on us each doing a little bit and doing a part for it to try to make, you know, our communities better. Yeah, definitely agree. You know, I definitely agree. That's some good advice, you know. Um, so, yeah, so what's that you do, what's that, that you do for fun in your spare time when you're not working? What, 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 what inspires you, gives you inspiration? Um, I like to go out. Um, so I've been doing a lot more stuff like going out, um, like going to parks and stuff and everything and spending more time outdoors as much as possible. Um, reading, watching TV. Um, I used to like going to the gym, sadly. <laughs> um, but that's about it. Um, trying to rest more self care and everything, trying to do that and trying to remember those things. Um, and remembering to take a break and um, and when I can, I also enjoy traveling. I love traveling, yeah, I hear that, you know. <laughs> so, what gives, so what gives you hope and inspiration? What inspires you to do what you do? Um, I think for the possibility of a better world and a better future, I have met so many people um, during my work um, and during my schooling and stuff and travels and stuff and everything and seeing how you know, people just kept the momentum on things and kept trying and, you know, going through those things. So I feel like, you know, there is a possibility, there is there is hope. Um, and being inspired by that, being inspired by hearing, you know, people's stories and everything and seeing the different things that they have done and, you know, the trial and tribulations that people have gone through, but they continue to keep moving forward despite of that. Um, and so I truly do believe that it's possible, but I understand that the road is hard and there is a lot of work, um, but it's, it's possible. It really is. I, I, I agree. It can be. I think, I think, I think, I think it's possible. I think it's possible. I think it's possible. Yeah. So do you have any plans for, do you, do you have any plans for holidays, Christmas, New Year's? Say that again? Do you have any plans for holidays, Christmas, New Year's? New Year's? Thoughts? No, no, I said, do, do you have any plans for holidays? Christmas. Oh, no, not this year, really. <laughs> no, just stay home and trying to stay safe. So that's the biggest thing. I think so too, me too, you know, because the world is very well, you know, stuff in any way can do, you know, so I think that's probably the best thing, you know, you know. Yeah, yeah. So how can we find so how can we find you on social media if you want if you want to contact you? How can we reach out to you on, on social media? Um people can link to me if they want to. Um you can send me a message or reach out to me in that that form of way. Um very simple, <laughs> you know. I don't really have any, you know, I don't have a Twitter or anything like that. So Okay, so this one my question. Um so um okay, so I guess my question is um um, 
If you could be okay, if you could be if you could be anything you want to be in the world, what would you be? If you could be anything you have, what would you want to be if you could be in in, in the world? Uh, I guess myself. I'm pretty satisfied. <laughs> I guess that's it. I um yeah, I don't know. I don't really have any I don't really have any other things. I feel like, you know, it's been a tough road, but I, I have feel like I've accomplished. Yeah. Um, and I feel, you know, there's more along the way and I would like to see that like wherever it may be, hopefully it's positive. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I guess like there's nobody else or any other thing that I'm, I would want maybe, maybe a foreign service officer or an ambassador or something. Yeah. Maybe, that, maybe that's it. <laughs> have you ever, have you ever thought about being, being a singer or an actress or being famous? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think uh, they said it best in the '90s: "More money, more problems." So, <laughs> so yeah, I remember that. You know, yeah, I hear that. You know, that's what people say. You know, <laughs> yeah. so I can't sing. Um, I and yeah, I I don't want to be a celebrity. <laughs> you know, okay, I guess I understand. You know, because but you wouldn't mind being president, right? Because because you can help people be president, right? Or being a governor. If I can, yes, yes. Okay, well, well, I think there's also probably a lot more other qualified people out there as well. <laughs> yeah. well, let's, let's, we'll, see, we'll see how I feel after I'm 35. <laughs> okay. I hear you. Like I said, well, if you if you ever decide to run for president of you, you got my photo, okay? I'll support you in Rain Kenny, though. So. Thank you. I appreciate it. I definitely. I love to look for you. I love to look for you if you can be president of I would love to look for you. I definitely support you. I love to you. This is a wonderful interview. So, so good to meet you and, and hear your story and, and learn, learn more about you because I was so inspired by your story. I thought I had to use I, had, I know I just had to meet you. I got to meet you today. Yes, it was very nice meeting you. Yeah, hopefully, and I'm still, like I said, I'm a boss. So hopefully, I'll see you on Boston. I live in Rockface, hopefully, in the next time, you know. So, you know, yeah, so um, yeah. it'll be great, you know. So, I hope to see you soon, you know. And, Reach out to me anytime you want, you know. And is it okay if I post? Is it okay if, if I post anything from you too much? Too much to sign Would you sign on the side of this one? I'll send it. I'll send. I'll, I'll send it tonight. Okay, you can sign for me. If you can, I can send. I can show on being in you know and post on YouTube. Post on send to you and post on, on YouTube. That's, that's okay with you. Yes, it's fine. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you. I love. I definitely appreciate this interview. It was good. To, it, was, it was an honor to meet you and meet someone who actually worked for Obama, for the president of the United States. You know, Obama. You know. Greatest president in the whole world. So I thought I'd meet, meet the first lady, Michelle Obama, because I met her too. She was some asshole just to meet you and hear your story. You know, it's a blessing. So I'm glad you come out, came on my show today and, and got to meet you. So I hope to see you soon. You know, and please stay in touch with me. Be good. I, I support you. And you I support you. I hope you wish you all the best and have a good holiday. You know, so. You too. Happy holidays. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.